Transportation assets like locomotives, cars, ships, and aircraft contain dozens of electronic components. These electronic components collect data and control subsystems to get people and goods where they need to go. In this episode, we invite special guests, Matt Rogers and James Carenti, to discuss the role of digital components in everyday transportation assets, what kinds of technologies make them tick, and what kinds of opportunities we have to make fleets smarter and safer using data. And finally, we'll discuss the state of cybersecurity in transportation fleets. Matt Rogers is a PhD student at the University of Oxford. His focus is on securing the decades worth of existing vehicles with data already available on the systems. James Karenny is a Shift 5 co-founder and currently CTO and VP of engineering. He's a former army officer and is currently focused on bringing delightful technology to operational technology industries. Guys, welcome to the show. Thank you for having us, Josh. It's great to be here. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Well, I think we should maybe start out with a little context building because the operational technology buzzword means a lot of things to a lot of people. To some people, it means ICS and SCADA systems, the things that make manufacturing and assembly lines and water treatment facilities and power plants work. To other people, it means IoT devices like a smart toaster or, or a refrigerator. Um, and I think for the purposes of our conversation, we're really focused on what we call fleet assets, right? So maybe we can dig into a little bit of what makes a fleet asset. So James, I don't know if you want to maybe describe some of the, the systems that we take a look at on a, on a daily basis. Yeah, sure. Uh, we really think uh, for fleet assets, we think of uh, anything that transports people or goods. Uh, and we really focus on uh, systems that have interconnected computers uh, through uh, something called a serial data bus. Uh, and this, these data buses, which we'll, I know we'll talk about a lot more in the future, but uh, they allow these different uh, su subsystems to communicate with each other and, and do everything on uh, the different uh, types of fleets. You know, we're talking about anything from your car that you drive uh, to and from work uh, to the Boeing 737 that you, you hop on to, to uh, travel across the Atlantic Ocean if I were to go visit Matt in Oxford, for example. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we, we don't really think about these uh, platforms or these, these fleets uh, as they impact our, our daily lives, but, you know, really we're, we are relying on these systems to, to get us to do all of the things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, these things are everywhere, right? You know, we kind of tongue in cheek call For them sure. planes, trains, and tanks. Um, but they they transcend all different kinds of industries. They're responsible for, for moving people around, for, for doing really critical things. I think they've been around for a really long time though, right? And so, um, you know, we've had operational um, technology, things like, you know, farm equipment or aircraft for almost a hundred years in some cases. Matt, can you tell us a little bit about how these systems have evolved over time and what that's meant as things like microcontrollers in silicon are finding their way into everything? Yeah, you know, all of these systems, they started extremely mechanically, right? But that causes a lot of limitations with how accurately they can work, some safety concerns, sort of what you can measure as you're actually designing the system. So people decided, hey, let's add a lot of electronics to these things, have them all communicate with each other, rather than having an engine just sort of run and have a bunch of mechanical gears regulate everything. Let's have a little computer actually start talking and regulate the opening of the valve and basically every single facet of how all of these different vehicles work. Um, and, you know, they kind of went in parallel with a lot of these things. So in the 1980s, you got the CAN bus by Bosch which is now used in basically every single consumer automobile and just, I mean, rail, agricultural equipment, frankly, just an absurd number of things. Satellites. <laughs> satellites sometimes. And then it's sort of in parallel, you got these other protocols too, based off of what different groups thought was necessary. So you've got like mill standard 1553 in the military avionics space, which was developed, you know, 1973 cars, we're starting to use it in the 1980s. Um, you got some, you know, other commercial avionic buses happening in there as well. Um, all of this was really just to make everything work interoperably. So all of these different companies needed all of their devices that they were making to actually speak to each other. So that, you know, you didn't just have one monolithic entity creating every facet of some aircraft, right? You needed subcontractors, et cetera. So instead you have all of these components and they speak over these same wires and Suddenly, you know, you can build a car with everybody's sensors just appended together into one thing. 
Yeah, amazing. Um, you know, and this happened really quickly, like over the period of like just a few decades, we've gone from totally analog systems to things that are essentially indistinguishable from a technology perspective, from like an IT network, right? You've got dozens of components that are computing, uh, that are that are communicating over these over these buses. Another really important thing that's happened over the past uh, decade or two is you know, electronic components started as a series of gates and low level hardware components, which, you know, I can say from experience, you know, electrical engineering is really difficult and it's distinct from, from software engineering. But what we've seen are these, these microcontrollers, these things that you can program with software to do things that were previously uh, the domain of pure hardware implementations are everywhere now, right? And so, given that microcontrollers have become really cheap to manufacture and it's opened up a whole other pool of, um, of potential talent to work on these lower level systems. Um, James, how has that changed the game for like how we think about something like an aircraft or a locomotive where it used to be a super fixed thing that was all hardware. And now all of a sudden you've got these like tiny little microcontrollers all over the place. Yeah, well, I mean, it it definitely is a huge saving, especially in aviation, right? Where where they're just always thinking about size, weight, and power of of the aircraft. Um, and so, uh, swap if if you're you're not familiar, um, that's the term that's used in the industry. And so, anytime those those industries can uh, find ways to reduce uh, their swap, uh, you know, if they can find more swap uh, sensitive components, like a microchip, for example, they're, they're going to move heaven and earth to, to make that happen. Because, you know, think about how expensive it is to maintain an aircraft while it flies through the air, all the, the fuel, uh, it turns out jet fuel is really expensive when you're uh, traveling across the Atlantic. And so, uh, the efficiency that uh, it can provide just by because like you know this this is operating in the real world is is like uh, paramount um, and I think also you know this this makes the the platform safer uh, more reliable uh, as, as is already mentioned and so you know safety is is always a, a top priority and consideration in these industries because they are responsible for uh, you know transporting human lives. Yeah, so that you've you've really opened up a world of different kinds of functionality now that you can lift all of these um, control systems and business logic into into a microcontroller. So the 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 picture we have here, just to summarize, is we started with these really useful pieces of technology that were totally analog, doing really important work on on things like farms and manufacturing and and, and power plants, and and these things have existed for a hundred years or more. The Silicon revolution has completely changed the way that manufacturers build these systems because they're cheaper, they're more reliable, and you can add more features to them. Uh, we've seen these components grow into basically things that are more powerful than, than the first um, you know, moon lander that we sent into space. Um, and they're running tons of software. And as, as Matt, as you mentioned, there's a network that's uh, communicating uh, all of this data from one microcontroller to the next. So you've got these giant computers that are doing really important things operationally. Maybe we can make that abstract concept a little bit more concrete for, for some of the uh, listeners. So maybe we could talk about a, a locomotive, for example, which is you know, an extremely important, historically, an extremely important uh, asset that like underpins a lot of uh, moving people and goods around in our economy and is a big driver for, uh, for why, we're, why we've seen such an expansion in wealth uh, over the past 150 years. Uh, these are giant multi hundred ton computers. Um, and so um, Matt, maybe we can dive in a little bit uh, to what kinds of tiny computers are on these systems and, and what sorts of things they're, they're doing and responsible for. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the craziest things about all of these different, you know, these serial data buses having everything lined up is they're doing what we're calling like driving by wire. Basically, whenever the, you know, the conductor of this train or this locomotive is, is doing anything, they're really just sending an electrical signal over this serial data bus. And then all of these computers are actually doing all of the work that used to be done by gears. So, you know, when they trigger any sort of brake, it's actually sending electrical signal to a computer, which then actually triggers the brake. Or, you know, you've got the engine control unit, which is regulating all of the emissions that are coming off of this bus. And then like, you know, based off of any sort of accelerant is opening and closing different flaps to allow more uh, fuel to go to the engine. 
Um, additionally, you've got like GPS sensors, a lot of, a lot of like rail tracking, that sort of thing. Um, in say like more modern automobiles, you might have like collision detection systems which are actively reporting sensor data back for what it sees in front of you. And then that goes to the braking systems. All of these computers are really just speaking directly to each other and then automatically responding based off of that data without any human input in between for a lot, a lot of the time. Yeah, so uh, automation in, in operational technology and, and fleet management is a really interesting and compelling you know, use case for all this technology. Uh, what, one thing that we've seen in the United States rail industry is the implementation of positive train control which is actually a system that uh, just kind of double checks that there's no human error while the train's operating. And so it can uh, help uh, uh, control the train remotely uh, to, and actually break the system if, you know, for example, um, there was an a, a train derailment ahead and, you know, the, the conductor didn't know that, you know, there was a impending peril in front of them and, and uh, they were, or, or they're, they're going around uh, a turn too fast because they weren't uh, necessarily paying as much attention as they really should be. Uh, so this is a, you know, a technology that really uh, can help us keep us safe. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. And these things are communicating in real time off of these assets um, back home so that operators and maintainers can get a real time situational awareness of like what's going on on these things. Um, but it's not just locomotives. I mean, there are other tons of other systems out here. You know, uh, James and I uh, served for a while in the U.S. Army, and we're, we were surrounded by systems that are, you know, on on their surface look like seventy ton um, uh, hunks of of armor and 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 guns and turrets. But uh, under the hood, they're you know literally a network of computers. So, uh, James, maybe if you could explain some of the subsystems that are on, say, a, a striker combat vehicle that um, yeah. that are really you know computers at at their core. Yeah, it's 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 interesting. I've heard uh, the striker described basically an uh, an F one fifty with a with a gun strapped to it. Uh, so uh, if you're un unfamiliar, Stryker is a uh, lightly armored uh, people carrier uh, that the Army uses. Um, yeah, it, it actually uses this CAN bus protocol that uh, Matt mentioned earlier to, to, uh, to do um, several different uh, key functions and then also has other systems that, that do a lot of electronic controlling of, of things like the uh, turret, for example, in, in different uh, variations of the platform. And, you know, it's it's, it's not really that different from even just a truck. It's just uh, got some fancy suspension and, <laughs> and some more uh, plating and, and a, a fancier engine just because, you know, all that extra weight means that there needs to be more horsepower to, to move the, the, uh, the striker at, at the speeds, uh, uh, which it can, which I, 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 I've, uh, I did actually happen to serve in a striker unit and those things can move really quickly. Uh, and the suspension is like top notch, like they're, they're really smooth. Like you don't even notice that you're going over a bump. Like you wouldn't it's not like that. a Bradley. Yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> um, awesome. Well, I mean, so we get this picture that all of these systems, including military weapon systems, things that move uh, people around and commute uh, people that uh, people around to their jobs, um, things that move all the goods and services we were buying on on Amazon. Um, all of this stuff is underpinned by by the network of tiny computers. So the evolution of these things happened over time. And much like IT networks, which started as an academic project in the, in the 60s and 70s, um, no one really designed these things from first principles with security in mind, right? We, we designed them incrementally with new features. You know, CAN bus came out when we realized that we couldn't continue wiring all of these sensors directly point to point to each other. And they said, you know, we could just daisy chain them and have them communicate on a bus. And, and there's a lot of value in that, in that, in that arrangement. Um, but we're seeing now that the result of this incremental design is, um, is maybe that we didn't think about cybersecurity from first principles, or uh, are there ways that we can take the data off of these devices and, and operate in a more uh, efficient way? So uh, Matthew, this is something that you're working very hard on uh, in, your, in your PhD studies. I mean, tell us, are these, did, we, did these things evolve in a secure way, or, um, or are there at least some desirable security features of these things, or are they just uh, totally unsecured at a core level, and, uh, and we've got a lot of work to do? I mean, probably that last one. I mean, you know, sadly, you know, you're, you're thinking about these vehicles and you kind of wish that it was different from the rest of the internet where you were kind of relying on some core infrastructure that didn't really start from a good place for security. 
Uh, instead, I mean, the, the core design principles of vehicles are really about safety. But when you're designing things from a safety perspective, you're not really assuming bad actors, you're just assuming failure states. And that's like this big difference between cybersecurity and safety is assuming that bad actor. But I mean, the main problem and why uh, all these vehicles are insecure is because you've got all these computers daisy chained on one network. Well, somebody just has to come along and pretend to be a computer on that network. And none of the other computers are gonna question who that new computer is. And they can easily lie and say that they're that, you know, some other computer on the bus. And there's absolutely no way of proving it, right? And so just, just like Ethernet, concept, right? Back in the, in the 60s and 70s when we designed Ethernet, it's the exact same. Exactly, right? So like, you know, the, the concept is just called authentication. And there's a lot of ways you can go about it. And you know, there, frankly, there's a lot of academic research, which is basically a trying to apply cryptography to all of these old vehicles. But you get this problem where, you know, you, you start thinking about like a traditional computer network and like, how long do you really have one server, one computer going? And the answer is, you know, maybe a decade, maybe more, but like hard drives start to fail. You might have a car or a tank or some aircraft for three decades, four decades, longer even. And so, the, I mean, this industry just has had no time to really adapt because of how expensive it is just to replace the bare components. And I mean, to add security, you'd have to reprogram every single one of these computers to f do that full authentication uh, scheme, right? You, you can't just implement it like it was nothing. Right, and this is, this is just one possible attack, which is putting a new device on a bus and, and getting, um, doing, you know, having some sort of nefarious behavior that you're, you're conducting from that device over the bus, which is totally trusting. But I mean, there are a lot of other attack factors, right, James? I mean, you think about supply chain attacks, for example, Absolutely. or, Absolutely. or vulnerabilities, um, you know, remote as access vectors, maybe, can you give us a, a sense of, of what the landscape of, of possible attacks is? I know you've done a lot of these, uh, in the military uh, doing yeah. cybersecurity risk assessments. So you, you, you probably uh, in the world, one of the, the, the people that has the best inventory of these possible attacks. For, for sure. Uh, kind of just to, to springboard with uh, what, what Matt was saying is, is the, the a refrain where I hear often is that um, physical security is kind of the, the core model that most of these uh, asset owner or at least fleet asset owners like kind of uses like their uh, mental paradigm for, for how they're providing security. Basically, Yes, I understand that there's a risk that if someone were to get onto my serial data bus and and you know uh, inject their code and, and 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 transmit messages across the bus, that that's a terrible thing. But you know I have a hard um, you know defensive shell, and so like that that is uh, they view it as impenetrable. Uh, but you know as we've learned in IT, like that the the concept of you know air gapping is is often pretty uh, simply overcome, uh, and so. When you think of all the different kind of a, a tactical techniques that a, a hacker would use to jump an air gap, um, they, they absolutely apply here. Uh, kind of the one that we think about the most, and and where we've seen um, some kind of really scary things is like uh, is is uh, maintainers of the systems. You know, they're they're constantly uh, plugging devices onto this network to do maintenance. So you think of the example of you have a check engine light that comes on your car. Uh, so you take it to the local mechanic. He or she is going to actually plug. Uh, a computer into your car and who knows what has happened to that to that system what what he what they are doing in their free time what kind of viruses that they've potentially exposed you know their system to and and now you're, you're essentially have, have very easily and successfully been able to uh, jump the air gap also just re as we've uh, we've alluded to earlier uh, these these protocols allow us to have a wide range of manufacturers uh, can uh, build systems that can go on to a wide, uh, you know, uh, wide number of different uh, fleets. And so, you know, we have to start thinking about the, the, the security of all of the different sub manufacturers like um, a Caterpillar or Hitachi, you know, they're, they're building uh, their code and they're putting code um, and shipping firmware updates uh, to, to different um, organizations, you know, cause like they want to keep the latest and greatest features on, on their hardware. So there's a whole several, a whole host of issues that can come out of that where, um, you know, how, how are the, those manufacturers ensuring that the code that they load on at, at manufacturing time is, is safe and secure and not compromised. And also uh, whenever they're pushing and distributing firmware updates, uh, you know, th that is traversing, usually traversing uh, 
often, not not usually, sometimes traversing the open internet. And so there's there's always a whole host host uh, a whole host of of problems that can happen there. And then also like the the final delivery method for for that software is is, all, uh, is often you know um, a maintainer is installing that uh, firmware update onto a laptop, plugging it in onto the fleet asset, and and uploading it across these these buses, which um, has just the same problems, you know, like there's, there's no guarantee that that security of that, that, uh, computer is, is, is there, there's, I, I would, I would guess most mechanics aren't running antivirus on their, uh, Windows XP box that they've been, uh, using for this purpose for, for years. Yeah. And I mean, so that's a lot of possible attack Absolutely. vectors, right? It's, oh, and, it sounds and, and really not, terrifying. And not to mention that like, you know, that's kind of like the old paradigm now, we're starting to uh, put all of these uh, computers on the uh, on the internet, right? So now we're just kind of opening up the whole system to just remote, uh, you know, remote attacks. Which, um, uh, sorry, what's that researcher's name? Uh, Charlie Miller. Charlie Miller. Yes, yeah, yeah, very, yeah. Uh, Charlie G-Pack, Miller demonstrated, yeah. uh, and you can go and 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 watch the GPAC. Uh, you know, that that's all remotely enabled, and um, more and more uh, wireless systems and wireless con- connectivity is being added to all these systems, you know, as we're, as we're starting to think about smart cities and, you know, like interconnecting every single uh, commercial automobile, like, how are they going to do that without some sort of remote way to, to uh, pass information between these systems? Right. And, and so, like, we get the impression that there are a lot of possible ways of getting into these systems that the consequences couldn't be more grave. I mean, you're talking about potentially loss of human life. Um, you know, we, we look at, this wasn't a cyber attack as far as we're aware, but the Boeing 737 MAX 8 was a sensor problem, right? This was sensor data going on the bus uh, that caused the, the aircraft's, um, uh, the aircraft's essentially like safety autopilot system to think that it was in a stall condition and actually put the plane into a, into a situation where the, the pilots couldn't recover um, effectively and, and, and they crashed and people died. Right. So I mean, the consequences couldn't be more grave for this. We've seen attacks on um, ICS and SCADA systems, right. Industrial control systems. These, these happen all the time. I mean, there's just, it seems like there isn't a month that goes by where we don't find a, a, a new, a new attack. There are lots of really interesting security research groups out of Dragos and Clarity and Nozomi that are constantly finding new threat actors. Um, so this is like very much um, a, a real thing that happens. Now for fleet assets, maybe we haven't heard so much about these kinds of attacks. Are they just theoretical or, um, you know, are there examples of these things happening or, um, or is it just that we just don't know about it because we're not monitoring for it? What, what do you think, Matt? I think it's a, a little of both. So, I mean, you know, there's a ton of academic literature in particular, you know, James brought that Charlie Miller hack, which uh, attack back in, I think it was like 2011 or maybe yeah, 2015, 2015. Was the hack in particular. Um, but, you know, basically for the last decade, people have been really looking into commercial or consumer automobile hacking. And it's been clearly proven that it's possible. It's, they've shown that they can do it. I mean, the nature of it is that, you know, we're talking about like going to your, you know, your maintenance dealership and getting that firmware update. The reality is, you know, the resources, the money isn't there for an attacker to want to hack just anybody from a maintenance device. And weirdly, a lot of the consumer automobiles, you know, we, we're talking about this, the standardization between computers and how they can kind of go over a whole fleet. Weirdly, consumer automobiles are almost exempt in the sense that Ford uses their own custom language when speaking on that CAN bus and so does Honda and every other auto dealership. And so because of that, like it's actually quite hard to propagate. But once you go from those consumer vehicles to sort of the things that are are perhaps more important and kind of run societies and militaries, your locomotives, uh, your trucking industry, um, a lot of agriculture, basically any industrial system or any military system that does become standardized. And so once you know how to speak on one thing, you can kind of speak on everything else. And, you know, frankly, uh, people have been a little bit slow on the on the up and up in terms of becoming more aware and thinking about these problems, um, partially because, you know, the ICS SCADA concept, mental conception of like, I want to take down a power grid. It's such, you know, a, it, it's a fun and easy, it's fun a talking point for a lot of attackers to, to consider in, in terms of the value of it. But once you start getting into like industrial and military context, 
I mean, taking down a multi-million dollar piece of equipment with a bit of code from a remote attack vector, I mean, the, the, the number of attack vectors is only increasing as time goes on. And there's only more and more motivation to get at these systems because they're, now they're talking to each other more. So if you get on one system and it's talking to, you know, one aircraft, say some next generation combat fighter, which is sharing intelligence with every other aircraft, like suddenly you might have a pivot vector. So now you can go from one that you've hacked to another one and you can just take down the whole fleet, right? There's a, there's a lot of ways that you can go about this. And so the incentives are only increasing. And I suspect that we'll just hear more and more about this in the coming years. Yeah, so I think a, a really interesting kind of a, a way we can think and frame this is is the Nopecha attack, which really, really affected, you know, the MERSC, like, you know, one of the world's largest shipping companies, right? Um, and this was kind of, this was a, an attack that originated on the IT side, but impacted their fleet assets because, you know, without, you know, they kind of, there's a marriage between the IT and the OT where, uh, you know, they, they, they couldn't really move their ships or, or unload goods like once they arrived at ports and it just caused backed up backups across the whole world and actually kind of really brought, you know, many like <laughs> kind of the movement of goods kind of to its knees across the world, you know, a huge percentage of, of the world relies on on that single single organization to, to move goods and uh, my understanding is that uh, the attack was done for kind of focusing on Ukraine, and it, it was a, an attack that kind of got out of, out of hand. But uh, why wouldn't a kind of a, a criminal organization try to um, leverage money from Maersk, right? You know, the, Maersk is probably losing billions of dollars a day during that. And, uh, you know, if, if they're just ransomware and computers and saying, if, pay me, you know, $10 million and this will go away and we won't tell anybody, uh, I think it's hugely compelling to, to these industries to to, to pay up. Uh, and, you know, we're seeing all sorts of, you know, public sectors being attacked with very similar uh, style um, hacks. You know, I think I, I saw another uh, news article today about how hospitals are being targeted uh, with ransomware attacks. And, and you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of non-traditional uh, IT things that that are very important to, uh, to hospitals um, as well. Uh, that, you know, like uh, what, what kind of networking goes on in a CT scanner or uh, um, an MRI. Or an operating room. <laughs> right, or an OR. Um, yep. I, I'm pretty sure they have all sorts of different things that, um, because like it's, it's you know, these old, uh, these different technologies that. It's all yeah, OT, I mean, right? And yeah. an MRI machine uses a CAN bus. That's how it's yeah. the computers right, yeah. inside of an MRI machine. Yeah. machine. Why would you reinvent another protocol for something that CAN is totally sufficient for, yeah. right? Yeah, you know. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, it costs a lot of money to reinvent. There's, there's a lot of eth, like approvals and regulations both around CAN. Why would you use anything else? I mean, and there's already a ton of components that 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 speak CAN, right? If you if you need an actuator for a robot arm, like you're just gonna say, oh, okay, like I this control board already uses CAN, like I'm just gonna design this thing around CAN, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the the more people that use it, the cheaper it gets because of yep. economies of scale, and so more yep. people use CAN, and it makes a ton of sense. Still not secure. It's but... still not secure. Yeah. And so I mean, like I know this can sound kind of like security nihilism for people that haven't really heard about fleet assets and cybersecurity or even, you know, ICS SCADA security. On the IT side, a lot of these systems started in a similar place, right? They started from a perspective of, hey, we need to be able to move data around. Um, we need to be able to install applications on an operating system. We need our employees to be able to access this particular system at, at, at given times. And then we realized like, oh my gosh, this is so useful. I would love to, for example, do banking transactions, but TCP IP is completely unsecured, right? And so we, we figured out ways of bolting security onto the side of these things. There's a whole vibrant ecosystem of IT cybersecurity vendors that are building critical components to monitoring these networks, to making sure that there's not unauthorized access from outside in the internet to make sure that we're monitoring behavior patterns inside of our organizations to, to see if something got compromised. Antivirus. I mean, there's this whole community of, of, of cybersecurity products. Matthew, do you, what do you see the evolution of OT cybersecurity looking like? So how, in other words, you know, you, as you mentioned, this is so interesting, you know, you might get rid of a server after six or seven years. Um, or, you know, we're flipping through iPhones every two, three years, but locomotives or military weapon systems or aircraft are going to be in service for decades. So we can't ignore all this old stuff while we're designing cybersecurity into the new stuff. What is 
the cybersecurity ecosystem going to look like when we try to go back and and retrofit security onto these older uh, older fleet assets? Yeah, you know, it, in a way, it, it depends on how we decide to kind of solve these problems. What I think is end up going to happen, inevitably going to happen with a lot of these uh, fleet assets, is that we're kind of catching up to IT all at once, at least trying to. So a lot of the kind of inner debates that IT networks have gone through over the past probably about decade, I would say, is this idea between like a perimeter-based defense and saying like, nobody can get into my network. Once you're, I'm in my, once you're in my network, I trust you. But up until that point, like, you know, it's really hard to actually get into the network itself, which is kind of what vehicles do now, right? They completely rely on this physical model that you can't connect to them versus what a lot of modern networks are transitioning to, which is, well, we're going to assume that we're breached at all times. We're going to monitor our traffic and we're going to try to find an attacker using a bunch of statistical analysis and heuristics and you know, rules and uh, intrusion detection systems, et cetera. And so really we're kind of trying to do both at once with, with vehicles, right? I mean, ideally you build this crypto system and for some vehicles, this is more legitimate than others, right? Um, if you have like, say like a, a bus on a satellite, it operates at, I think it was maybe like near a gigabit per second, which is fast enough that any amount of overhead from a little bit of crypto is not really going to hurt you. But when you're talking about these older vehicles, things made in like the 2010s, early 2000s, they're operating at 250 kilobits per second. And to put that in perspective, if you start doing some math for some of the different crypto papers, you might be adding basically for every single message that you send over this bus, you're adding the overhead of two additional messages at minimum, from at least from some of the papers I've seen. So it's just really not feasible to implement. And so really the sort of other paradigm of security is this idea of like a patch system. You install another computer on the bus and you take advantage of the same thing that the attackers are doing. You know, the attacker can see everything that's going on over that bus because everything's daisy chained together and can inject any messages at once. Well, Defender, if you plug into that bus, you can read every single message on that bus and you can do a bunch of analysis on it. And so that's kind of where these systems are going is, you know, a, a car inherently or any sort of these fleet transport systems, they, they run like clockwork. They're, they're state machines inevitably. You know, all computers are state machines, but these are a bit more predictable than most. So you can actually like look and do a bunch of timing analysis and data analysis and try to find out all these different attack vectors. Um, and you know that's where a lot of the research has been going over the past 10 years is initially a lot of timing analysis, just, hey, some new computer is speaking over the bus. Obviously this is wrong because that computer they're claiming to be spoke you know, five milliseconds ago and they speak every 20 milliseconds, right? A lot of basic stuff like that. And then we're slowly getting more into this more advanced era where, hey, let's not just look at the metadata for these messages, let's look at the contents, right? This is how fast the engine is going. Um, these are all these different characteristics. This is what the GPS is reporting versus what the accelerometer is reporting. How do these, you know, what do we expect these fields to look like? And with that, you can slowly decrease your number of false positives or flag what you think might be true uh, until inevitably you can actually detect an attacker with a pretty good percentage of the time. Yeah, I mean, it's a really um, tried and true method of, of trying to defend something that was fundamentally not designed with cybersecurity is, hey, let's introduce an additional component into this system that can monitor for intrusion. It's this whole defense in depth idea, right? So like if, if the system, you know, you do everything you can to make sure it doesn't get compromised. Invariably, the ingenuity of, of, of smart people, they're going to figure out a way to get into a system. Um, you know, you just look at things like Stuxnet and you're like, wow, that is an amazing amount of effort that went into getting uh, into Iran's nuclear reactors, right? Like if there's not too many things on the planet that are more secure than, than, than nuclear enrichment sites. Um, and, and invariably people figured out a way in. Uh, so the idea is you, you, you get in there, you monitor and you, in, at some level you say, okay, we shouldn't get compromised, but like, let's assume we got compromised and make sure and, and monitor for it so that we can detect it um, and, and, and mitigate the damage and, and, and clean up after it. It also strikes me um, uh, that uh, something really interesting that if you're on these data buses and you're collecting all of this data uh, for, for cybersecurity purposes to make sure that no one, no one is, a, is attacking you, as you mentioned, Matthew, you're looking at this system like a state machine and you're you're doing analysis for things like anomalies and making sure that the thing is operating within its correct characteristics. And 
what's kind of interesting about operational technology is that it's used for operations. And so you can take this data and, and use it, of course, to make sure that the things are secure, but potentially there are a lot of other uses for this data. Uh, James, what are some of the things that we can do with, with full take packet capture that's coming off of a, a fleet asset? Yeah, uh, there, there's a lot. So, um, you know, at, at a very, uh, from a, a, maintain, uh, a maintenance perspective, you know, as I think you alluded to before, there, there might not be that much difference between a maintenance problem and a cybersecurity problem, right? It, that's kind of more of intent rather than like what's actually happening. Uh, on the system. So um, using the, that terrible uh, Max 8, uh, 737 Max 8 incident, right? You know, that you have a sensor that's that's not behaving properly for whatever reason, and it is, uh, you know, wreaking havoc on the bus. And so being able to kind of recreate what happened, uh, you know, post uh, a terrible, terrible incident, uh, you know, you can actually like, I I'm sure it's, it's hugely beneficial for uh, the, the avionics industry to you know, do everything they can to reduce uh, <laughs> to do, uh, airplane crashes for for obvious the, the very basic reason of like you know they're carrying people's lives, but you know, also there's economic kind of benefits you know from an insurance perspective uh, probably. But then you can kind of get into kind of more nuanced uh, uses of this data from from a predictive maintenance uh, you know um, uh, capability. One of the things that's very common that's built into these these uh, bus protocols is is to how to how to act when uh, a system is is doing something inappropriate on the bus, uh, and usually that's from a, that uh, theoretically it was supposed to be from like a harbor failure, right? So, uh, say what happens if for for whatever reason uh, an engine control unit on your car just wants to, you know, uh, it's broken uh, and it's just holding you know the uh, the can line high, right? It's 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 taking control of the can line because it you know, it's state machine broke and it didn't move off of that state. And so now no computer can uh, communicate on the bus or yeah, across the bus and, and your car is going to stop. And so being able to detect the, the deterioration of that, uh, that microcontroller, uh, you know, a month ahead of time uh, and, and alert you that like, hey, this, this, this system is starting to perform poorly and you should uh, get it checked out uh, before, you know, you're, you're, shooting down the highway and uh, you just stop, uh, which could, you know, I uh, assume would be uh, horrifying and, and obviously like, you know, you're really at risk. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it, yeah. it's, um, maintenance, maintenance uh, from, from the army, what my most of my maintenance experience comes from uh, being a junior officer in the, in the uh, army. And, you know, every thousand hours that I would run a generator, it, it would have to be stripped down to like nuts and bolts and, and like had a thorough diagnostics check uh, by, you know, pretty senior mechanics, you know, like they, you know, these, these, these folks were really knew their stuff and, and were really specialized, but uh, potentially we could, rather than having to do just routine maintenance, you know, um, we could just have more uh, uh, maintenance driven by, you know, the, the status of the systems on there. And, and we could use that information to kind of have huge savings costs across um, all, all these different industries using this uh, really important data. Yeah, and I mean, I think you're seeing a lot of OEMs, the 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 companies that make these fleet assets, starting to incorporate these things uh, into new systems, right? As we mentioned, this actually, if it's not done correctly, can create a really terrifying um, yeah. access vector. Uh, you know, yeah. Tesla, for example, kind of famously participates in these bug bounties, like Hack the Model Three, where you know you're you're trying to do things like pivot through the the browser on on the infotainment screen, or use the update, you know, compromise the update mechanism so that you can load malware onto onto a Tesla, uh, which is all drive by wire, right? Um, but we're also seeing this in in uh, in industries like locomotives um, or in maritime, where manufacturers are starting to put telemetry uh, solutions onto systems. They call it, you know, industrial IoT is is a term that that gets used out there. But Matthew, like you mentioned, there are decades worth of quote unquote legacy assets out there that don't benefit from this kind of real time flow of information coming off of things. Um, it strikes me that if you're going to put a cybersecurity solution or, or a monitoring solution onto a legacy asset, you could also dual purpose that data to, to get industrial IoT-like um, information for maintenance, operations, uh, reporting um, you know, for environmental, social, and governance type things uh, off of these systems. Is, is that right? It, you know, how, how, do you, how do you think about potentially plugging a system onto these 
uh, onto these these platforms and, and getting non cybersecurity value uh, off of the data streams. Yeah, you definitely can do that. I mean, the ideally, if you think about it, right, having this industrial IoT, taking your old systems and throwing, you know, thousands, tens of thousands, even more amount of US dollars to like build sensors and then add sensors to these existing systems. That's, that sounds great. You're probably going to get a lot of data out of that. But gosh, it's expensive when all of these things are already connected and already sharing all of this data. Um, of course, you are limited by what you already have in that legacy device, right? But that legacy device almost certainly has sensors. And the kind of data that you need to send from uh, system to system in order to operate most of these fleet assets is basically the same information that you would want from all of these different sensors because they're reporting on how they're doing just so that they can operate. Also, these things were built with a lot of error states in mind. And so they're actively reporting you know, what they would consider error conditions. And even just being able to you know, diagnose something in real time as it's happening, as opposed to, you know, a light turns on or there's some background thing. And once somebody plugs in a maintenance computer, it uh, tells them that. And right, you've you know, got to walk around in. the maintenance yard, plugging in right. RS-232 cables into every single one of your, uh, one right. of your a, locomotives and, and hope it, that the maintainer catches it. Yeah. Right. It's a nightmare and it's a huge logistical challenge. So if you could just install a computer that does all that for you, that's, that's great. Of course, you know, some groups are less open to the idea of like, having any sort of data stream off and you still need to do that. But even then, like having any sort of aggregation is, is still useful. And, it, and it's not like this idea hasn't been tried in some way before, right? Like in the, particularly for consumer automobiles, I mean, cars export a ton of insurance data about how you're driving and how, I mean, basically in order to calculate what they think your insurance costs could, should be, or, you know, reporting that to the uh, original equipment manufacturer to sort of determine what might break. Um, you know, and originally, you know, this started, if you take your mind all the way back to like those, I think they were either all state or progressive ads where you got a yeah, like, safe driver discount. Yeah, exactly. It was, you know, pay us. Uh, they're very forward thinking, you know, just give us your data and we'll make things cheaper for you. Yeah, it literally right. plugs into the CAN bus on your car. Like that's right. not, yeah. which is hor horrifying. Um, but <laughs> Uh, like really clever idea at the time, right? And it, you know, things like this exist and are totally possible. But if you're gonna go ahead and do all of this data analysis or export all of this data, you might as well do a bunch of cybersecurity analysis while you're there. Because if you're already adding a computer to the bus, I mean, the the computational overhead of doing both is, is not so extreme. Like, um, and like James was saying earlier, right? The the difference between a maintenance attack and a cyber attack oftentimes kind of hard to distinguish because it is about that intent. So you, so you might as well do both. Yeah. And, and um, I think bringing up uh, self-driving cars here is, is really interesting as well, because, you know, how, how are we going to um, develop how that, that actually looks at, as, you know, we're trying to, uh, what human interaction on the bus actually looks like so that we can model it for the future. And, um, you know, that, that, technology is going to be really important and, and all that data is, is hugely valuable. I, I haven't talked to uh, an organization that, uh, you know, or, or an OEM that, um, you know, we're interacting with their platform that they haven't been interested in some sort of agreement. Like how, how do we, like, once you're, you know, you're, you're done doing an assessment, like how do I, how do I get access to that raw data um, that, that you guys are collecting? Yeah. I mean, I think, to summarize all of this, we are in a situation where all of these assets that are out, these, these fleet assets are going to be in service for decades. They were designed in a way that, uh, that they're designed for physical safety and reliability and robustness in the phys physical world. No one designed them with cybersecurity in mind. And increasingly, we're finding that there's an opportunity to pull the data off of these systems to do all kinds of anomaly and, and uh, detection for maintenance and operations purposes. And so it, it strikes me as, I know it's, we're probably not a great spot today with, with respect to cybersecurity and with respect to being able to manage fleets um, in an effective and efficient way. But I'm pretty hopeful that in the future, we're going to um, not only go back to these legacy assets and uh, upgrade them so that they're, they're more secure, they're, they're faster, they're, they're safer, and they're easier to, to operate, um, but that in the future, we're going, to, uh, we're going to design systems that are more secure. Matthew, I know this is a, a big part of your research and some of the, the, uh, the groups that you work with uh, in doing 
uh, research for how to make these systems from first principles more secure. Can you maybe comment on where you see things going? And are you generally hopeful about, you know, when we're looking back 50 years from now, and we're going to say, wow, that was a wild time when these things were completely unsecured, but we're in a pretty good place now? Yeah, I, I'm generally hopeful. But a lot of the reason for that is because the, the speed of these serial data buses is by default getting faster. You know, in CAN bus, there's now this new protocol, new protocol called CANFD, which is actually starting to be implemented, which allows you to just transfer data at, at, at a much quicker rate. I think it's like five megabits per second as opposed to 250 kilobits before. It, it's absurd. Um, and so what that allows is actually doing a lot of this authentication schemes, which are kind of how we improved, like we said earlier, those TCP IP networks, the traditional internet networks. You know, that approach is how we secured a lot of our existing legacy systems and how we made the internet more secure going forward. But in addition, you know, we, we mentioned briefly like supply chain attacks as an attack vector. You know, even if you install this on authentication systems on there, you're still going to need a lot of that. What if a bad actor gets in and affects an existing computer that we already trust? You're still going to need all of this monitoring. So even as we're securing these legacy systems, all of that knowledge, all of that analysis can only help with future systems. Um, of course, there's ways to design different bus architectures. So it's harder for an attacker to even plug in, to even get attached um, to, you know, as you're adding all of these remote systems, making it so it's much harder for an attacker to actually get in there. But even assuming if they do, you know, all of this work we're doing for legacy systems helps. So I, I'm pretty optimistic for the future. Um, going forward, it's just going to take those uh, couple of manufacturers to sort of take the bold leap and, you know, maybe try out a new protocol, or if they're trying things out, going a little bit faster, and then all of the sort of supply chain trickling down as people meet these requirements for increased security. Yeah, I, I think that's, I think that's totally right. James, you spent a lot of time looking at military systems. And of course, there's a lot of stuff you can't talk about, but there there are um, a couple of really important reports out there from the Government Accountability Office, the GAO. I think the most recent one was in 2018, where they uh, totally unclassified described like just how grave this problem is. And I think echoes a lot of the, the narrative um, plot lines that, that we've talked about uh, today. Um, where do you see the future of military systems? Are you are you hopeful that we're starting to look at weapon systems in the military and fixing some of these cybersecurity issues? And and are, and and looking forward, are you seeing, for example, in the optionally manned fighting vehicle, um, you know, which was almost a little terrifying that there might be a cybersecurity uh, problem with it with a tank that is remote controlled? Um, yeah. But are you seeing encouraging signs? On, on the DOD side, on the on the kind of government side, in in, in getting cybersecurity and, and smarter operations into these weapon systems. Totally, totally. I think uh, the the biggest thing that I think is important uh, when we think about how the military procures these systems is is that the requirements need to be written. That's just kind of if it's not, you know, uh, like in the document that the um, the organization that's asking, you know, and and bidding and and getting all these different, um, you know, defense contractors to build them a new platform like the OMFE. Uh, if it's not there from the start, uh, it, it will not be done. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, we, Mike, uh, Mike, uh, the other co-founder and myself, and, and, you know, Josh was also definitely helped. We were, when we were still in the army, we were really thinking about how we kind of message this problem uh, internally so that uh, the organization was like aware that, you know, how, large a scope problem this was. And, and I think, you know, over our time, um, we, we definitely saw the, um, the, you know, it's, it's slow, to, it's slow to turn, but the, the, you know, uh, the ship was kind of, kind of steering in this direction um, to kind of borrow some. <laughs> See what you did there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah thank you. Um, you know, it's slow moving, but like, you know, we're seeing progress. Uh, Congress passed legislation in uh, 2016 as part of the, you know, the, the omnibus bill that, you know, funded the, um, the DOD in 2016 to actually do uh, security assessments against all these platforms. And, you know, very naturally um, problems are going to, you know, the, the problems that we're talking about today are, are, are probably going to exist there. And, and um, I don't think um, any of these organizations are going to kind of, uh, uh, you know, let those things slide. And, and from talking to organizations and OEMs on the military side, you know, they're, 
they're kind of getting to the point where they understand the problem. They, uh, they describe it as like, I've been poked in the eye enough. Like, I get what you're saying. You don't have to keep poking me in the eye. I need you to like provide me like a, an eye poker. Help me solve right? the problem. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. They were like, please, like, okay, you could, if you can poke me in the eye, but show me uh, at the same time that um, you can solve this, this for me, you know, like they're going to be, they're starting to be very receptive. Um, I think they're just really tired of getting beat up about it. And they're like, all right, let's just solve this problem. Um, and like, you know, let's get after it. Awesome. Well, I'm pretty hopeful that we're, we're headed in a great direction. I think we're, we're looking at these legacy systems that aren't going anywhere. There are trillions of dollars of these things out there. And, and there are a lot of smart folks that are, are trying to figure out how we retrofit solutions to, to make these things smarter and safer. And it sounds like we're, we're really raising awareness around these core issues uh, and, these, and these big vulnerabilities. And that uh, both in the academic community and in industry, uh, manufacturers are starting to think about how to design these things with, with, with safety, security, and cybersecurity uh, in mind going forward. So James, Matthew, uh, I really appreciate you coming on the show to share some of your thoughts and expertise on this. And I hope I can uh, have you on again soon. Thanks for yeah, inviting thank us, you. Josh. Anytime. Thank you for listening to this episode of Planes, Trains, and Tanks. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving us a review. To learn more about Shift 5 and our products, visit our website at shift5.io or follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter.